<laughs> oh, I didn't state. Yeah, so there's five. So you have Simon four, which I just handed out, and then um, then we, like, we after the due date of that, there's basically two more weeks of lectures. But I think assignment five will be a bit shorter, <clears throat> and then the computational project, worth twenty percent apparently. Did you guys go to Zamologikov's talk? Yeah, it was awesome. He gave like a whole colloquium on the two D Ising model, and you know it's it's really uh, it's really deep in some sense. You could have a whole graduate class on the 2D Ising model that nobody would show up. <laughs> so you have to call it quantum anybody theory. But he like, <laughs> yeah, basically, it's basically what it is. So Zamologikov predicted, I pulled a paper, you guys can look at it, it's pretty funny. So if you take the transverse field Ising model in 1D, which you looked at and you'll also look at in your computational assignment, and you put it in a, uh, like a small symmetry breaking Longitudinal field, like a like a sigma z field. <clears throat> then uh, you push it a little bit off criticality. So you're right near this quantum critical point. You push it a little bit off criticality, and then it gets a really complicated theoretical structure. So it's basically like you you gap out a bunch of masses. You gap out a bunch of particles, and these particles have different masses. So I'm talking about the philosophy where you have some sort of like vacuum state, you know, and uh, um, and, and then, you know, quasi-particles, if you will, are excitations out of this vacuum state. So right at a quantum critical point, there's no well-defined quasi-particle excitations ever. Um, but if you, if you kind of push yourself a little bit off criticality, you get all these particles popping out. And very near criticality, Zamologikov solved this, this 2D Ising plus longitudinal field problem and showed that these, these particles how this, you know, the, the theory is a certain really very high symmetry. It's an E8 symmetry, it's called. So it's one of these continuous symmetries that you encounter um, in this Lie group, but it's, you know, you have like U1 and you have SU2, all these symmetries that we've seen. But I think this is the highest continuous symmetry possible, or discovered, or I don't know how group theory works. So, so it's, this, it's this really like complicated, it's this really complicated symmetry. And, and strangely enough, all the particles that, that pop into existence as you push this thing off the critical point, um, basically have masses, and the ratio of the masses obeys the golden, what's it called, the golden ratio? So just mathematically, you get this golden ratio of all these mass masses, M1, M2, all the way up to the eight masses that occur in this E8 uh, Lie group. So Zamologico have put a recent experiment, and I pulled the paper, it's in science, uh, from Caldea's group. And what Caldea did was he uh, <clears throat> he did neutron scattering on on this material. I think it's called cobalt niobium. Oops. And B two o six. So it's just some material that that Caldea grew in his lab, basically. But the 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 sort of microscopic structure of this material, I'll pass this around. There's a picture of it here. It's all these weird, like, I don't know. It's this weird three-dimensional structure, but the interactions are such that it's basically like a zigzag Ising chain. So you, you sort of get like a 1D chain like that that's part of a larger crystal structure. And, you know, just by chance, that thing is the transverse field Ising model. <laughs> like there's an Ising axis, and then what Caldea did was he applied a field in the, in the X direction. And so we, it's literally, that's why they call it a transverse field Ising model. So it seems strange, like it's like, you just put this crystal in, you align it, and then you apply the correct uh, direction of the field, and all of a sudden, the theory is quantum. Well, he's at really low temperatures. Um, so you have to be below three Kelvin, basically. Um, yeah, well, depends if you're doing neutron scattering. You have to have the fridge inside of like the beam line and everything, right? So that's what these guys are doing. And so then you put on a small longitudinal field. HZ, and he broke the symmetry of the, you know, so he tunes it to the quantum critical point, and then he breaks the symmetry of the small HZ or HZ field, and he measures basically the structure factor, which is like, what does he call it? He calls it SZZ. So it's at zero momentum, but it's at uh, frequency omega, which is just like the Matsubara 
uh, frequency transform, you know, sig uh, whatever, SZ, uh, X, SZ0 correlation function. So basically, that, that's what neutrons can access. You can access it at different momentums, but, but it, it's, it's essentially the two-point green function, or the green function for the spins, um, but, you know, in momentum space and in, in frequency. So you'd have, to, you'd have to figure out how to do this sort of, uh, this Matsubara analytical continuation to get this. But you can still look at basically the energy structure of this thing. So remember the energy structure is like the poles of the green function. You know? um, and so when, when Caldea does that calculation, he, he can only see the first two masses, so because the, they're the like, largest um, masses that pop into existence, but they have exactly the ratio from the golden mean. And so it's basically the first confirmation that this like Zamologikov symmetry exists in nature. And it's pretty cool. It's just done with like this weird material, and he throws it in a he throws it in a beam of neutrons. So this structure factor was actually calculated in I'm gonna say the 90s, which seems a little late, but um, the, 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 all, the, all that sort of, you know, the, this E8 symmetry thing was known since probably the 70s or something, but this structure factor was calculated basically in the field theory, just like you guys are doing. Um, and this could be compared directly to the experimental, experimental thing. So, so that's basically what Zamologikov was sort of talking about yesterday. He talked a lot more about the theory. So I think that's kind of a good example of, of what you aim to motivate you know, studying this type of stuff that we're doing in this class. You could, you could literally calculate the same, you know, the same structure uh, for these correlation functions that you would look at in these experiments like, like Caldea did on this, this material. Another thing, another thing I wanted to mention last time is when, you, when you're looking at these two-point correlation functions, because um, I finished kind of fast, what did we do? We did 1D. So I called this thing G. We calculated these in the free theory last time. And like I said, it's the, the object I'm calculating is really a two-point correlation function between a field. That's just a, you know, that could be a field too. Um, generally, it's just some field at x equals 0. And there's some correlation between this and another field at x equals x, right? And that basic object, the thing you're looking at, is, is the two-point correlation function between these at a distance, you know, x minus 0, which I just call x. And that's justified essentially in the structure of, of this green function that we calculated. last time, which very generally, if you're away from criticality or in the scalar, the free scalar field theory that we worked on last time, when your R, which is called a mass sometimes, is equal to zero. <clears throat> so in this Caldea experiment, that, that would occur, I mean, it's, it's not a free theory, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Ising scalar theory. It's actually a phi 4 theory in this experiment. We're only doing the phi squared theory. That's what we did last time. We're going to work on the phi 4 theory now. But, um, you know, this, is, this occurs, this mass goes to zero right at the critical point. And I'll, I'll sort of justify that a bit later in the lectures when I talk about Landau theory. But then what happens is, in this specific case, a bunch of masses pop out when you, when you tune it away from criticality. And those masses are interpreted just like this R parameter in, in your field theory. When, when a mass is zero, oh, sorry, this is, this is mass not equal to zero. <clears throat> when mass is zero, then the two-point correlation function diverged in 1D. Oops. Um, that's called an IR divergence as opposed to a UV di divergence. So it's, it's the infrared length scale. It's the large length scale, which gives you the, the divergence when the mass is equal to zero. And you actually have that divergence in the free scalar theory 
uh, for any dimension less than or equal to two, which is dimensions one and two. So, so this this is actually, you know, if for the mass the massless theory, you get this for d equals one and d equals two. But if you're in a higher dimension, um, you can actually have a massless theory that doesn't have this this divergence, and the structure of that correlation function then makes some sort of sense. So for, I'll just write it down here. Just as gamma function, which pops out sometimes in these things. So just some constant basically depending on your dimension and then x to the two minus d. <clears throat> okay, so for 3d and 4d and so on, you get a decay that looks looks like that. <clears throat> That's just for the free theory. Okay, so there's something a little pathological about these dimensions uh, in the free scalar theory. When you have a Ising theory or phi four theory, it's actually a different situation. Okay, so it's just sort of a it's sort of an issue with the the, uh, the Gaussian theory. <clears throat> so in order to sort of deal with this type of system, this, you know, we have to add the phi four term. And what you're doing in your assignment four is, is calculating the phi, or deriving the phi four field theory directly from the Ising model. And so you can imagine you're driving the theory directly of that, that uh, quantum critical point that occurs in, in this Calde experiment without the small symmetry breaking field. And so you might say, well, how do you calculate that that correlation function, this, the SZ, SZ correlation function. And so that's basically the subject of, of perturbation theory. So, you know, if you didn't do this, if somebody didn't do this 20 years ago, you could get a science paper from, what, <laughs> from doing this now. Actually, probably it was done more than 20 years ago. Um, so we know how to solve Gaussian theories. That's the point of all this. You know. We know how to take expectation values when the weight is is a Gaussian. We know how to do the Gaussian integral, um, but when we have interactions, you know, the Gaussian theories essentially ignore the interactions. So. so the term that we're ignoring in the action, okay, so that's my space-time dimensions. <clears throat> um, let me see if I can write this the same way I did last time. So it's R over two. Okay, so that's the that's the Gaussian piece. That's the piece that gave us all these correlation functions. Well, that one that I derived anyway. So I'm going to add, remember the, the, the parameters in front are essentially arbitrary for our purposes, although you'll be deriving them. So I'm going to call this one R and this one U. Sometimes it's U2 and U4 or something like that, because this is the 5, 4, 5, 4 term here. Okay. So sometimes you could write this as, you'll see this written as, um, the non-interacting part, like S naught. This is the interacting part, S1 or SI, I don't know, maybe I. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so we only know how to essentially solve this or to do the integral when this SI is equal to zero. And it's just a fact of life that if you want to, say, calculate a correlation function like that, uh, when you have the phi four term, you have to do it perturbatively.
So we're just going to look at the sort of general features of the perturbation theory to start with. We'll want to calculate two-point correlation functions, but let's first look at something a little simpler, maybe, uh, the free energy. So, so I'll use log. We're talking about log of the partition function, basically. So we can imagine we have a Euclidean action, right? So space and time are isotropic. Maybe we've done a Wick rotation. And that small d takes the space and the time coordinates into account. So we have a well-defined partition function. Remember, we have to have a functional integral over e to the minus action, which has two parts. OK, that's the, that's the cryptic way to write it. <clears throat> this is an integral over all possible you know, field configurations in this extra uh, space-time sort of dimension that came from all those insertions of resolutions of the identity and so on. So let me factor out Gaussian parts. So I keep this functional integral. <laughs> I'm just going to multiply by e to the minus Gaussian action on top and bottom. And then we're going to integrate, or the integral of that, I'll just add in, I'll just multiply and divide by that thing. That'll work. So I've multiplied and divided. <clears throat> what we have here is just the partition function for the Gaussian theory. This is the partition function for the Gaussian theory. So it looks like I'm calculating the expectation value of e to the minus si, right? But it's the Gaussian expectation value. So I'll write that thing as z naught. This thing here. Gaussian. And then the expectation value of this thing is the Gaussian expectation value, and that's really what defines that notation. And then that SI is just, you know, I, I wrote, don't forget that there's an actual integral there. So let me call that, let me call that integral, which is integral over all these coordinates. I'm just going to label this set of coordinates or this coordinate system by R. So that thing is just integral over r, u over 4 factorial by 4. <clears throat> I'm doing this careful because we've got to keep track of all of these coefficients soon here. OK, so that, that's just a shorthand notation for all that, that, cor that uh, coordinate system. Now I'm going to expand the exponential. It's like all we do in this class, right? Expand exponential, insert resolutions, the identity. <clears throat> so then the expectation value <coughs> 1 minus si plus 1 over 2 factorial. plus higher order terms. Oops, I probably need a square here. <clears throat> right, so I can just write this thing as the expectation values over each one of these pieces separately.
Scalars come out front. And let me label my fields with the coordinates. Let me just see if I need that. Yeah, that really defines what the greens function is. So that's 5, 4. I've, I have the expectation value of SI, this thing squared. So we better have two different indices for all the coordinates. Right, and then it's any yeah, and each one of these expectation values is the Gaussian one, right? I've just brought it inside the integral. <clears throat> okay, so all of a sudden you see that the expectation value. Or the perturbation theory is defined in terms of this, this coupling U, which you should be suspect whether or not that thing's actually small. And actually, this is the fundamental problem with this type of field theory for interacting systems, is that it's very difficult to justify a priori the fact that that U is small. Okay. <clears throat> so basically what field theory people do is just ignore that fact and just plow, plow ahead with this, this perturbation theory. Because almost literally there's nothing else you can do <laughs> besides maybe like numerical solutions or maybe some like ADS CFT or something like that. <clears throat> so okay, there's a whole industry um, built on this. And we, we're in good shape because we know how to calculate each one of these types of correlation functions with, with Wick's theorem. So I, I probably wrote them. That, was it exit? I can't remember what it is. Yeah, I wrote it was all X's. Now I have phi's, right? So if you look back at that example I did for the, I think it was X3. X or something like that. Remember I had, I had these diagrams that I connected, which looked like this and this. I connected that three different ways, right? So that gave me something that's like three times the green function, and now, each one of these is labeled by two indices, each G, if you will. It was like P and P prime, or it was, you know, it, when we derived it with, with uh, that combinatorical argument, it was like KI and KJ. So those indices are now, um, are now these, these coordinates, or these set of coordinates that occur in the action. So I've abstracted this quite a bit, but it's all still valid. So you have to do the functional rep integral sort of representation of this. So I can label this G by R and R prime, but I'll label it by R minus R prime for this reason here, because in these green functions what occurs is, is some functional form like that. Okay, so I quite generally, remember I have R and R prime, so I have R minus R, times G of R minus R prime, or R prime minus R, let's do it like that. <clears throat> okay, so it's just a way of labeling, you know, from Wick's theorem, which, which correlation functions I'm gonna calculate in these coordinate systems. And this one, I'll just write as G zero, and so this is G R prime minus R. <clears throat> Right, does everyone remember this? Remember I connected, why, why is it R minus R 
it's because I connected these two, say, and then I connected this one. So that one, you know, and I, and I can do that three different ways. Three times this. Does that seem crazy? Does this make sense? I don't see anyone nodding. I feel inadequate as a professor. <laughs> but the feeling passes, so. So now we're just going to calculate the ones that we actually need here. Okay, we're just going to use this diagrammatic language that we developed last time. Okay, so that's a fairly high level of abstraction, I guess. We're dealing with the functional integrals and everything, but all this formalism that we developed in the last class applies. And what we don't know how to calculate, or I haven't said, is what these g's are yet, right? We, we've done it in a non-interacting theory. That's what the g is there. But for right now, we're just going to write this perturbation theory in terms of these sort of fundamental two-point correlation functions, which is everything that you boil out of the Wick's theorem. So this integral I hesitate to write equal signs here. I don't know why. But we have a single vertex R, and we have four fields coming out of it, if you want to say, say it like that. And you have to think of all the possible ways that you can connect those, those vertices. All right, so, you know, there's, there's one, then, then there's this one, then there's one where you connect them diagonally. I don't know. <clears throat> is that all? That's that. This is like literally what the you have to figure out how to do. Is they all the possible combinatorial ways of of connecting those vertices, and so that looks right. So, so then all you do is write down you know three times um, g, uh, and it's r minus r. <clears throat> Okay. There's still an integral outside of that. So it's like Is that too much? Let's do the other one. The other one's the uh little bit more interesting here. Okay, so so we have five four. Five four R and R prime. You might label these by, by g naughts here if you want. So you remember that these are Gaussian, but I'm not doing that. Right. What, what happens with the integral? I'm going to do it after. Okay. I'll do the integral next. I mean, it diverges, right? Diverges. Yeah. So it'll go as L to the D or something like that. But we'll discuss that. So this is the free energy calculation. So that actually matters. The integral matters. But first, I'm getting the combinatorial factors out. So. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good. That's why it didn't make any sense, right? Why is it squared, right? Because there's two of them. You, you form two loops there. Thanks. Okay, so this one. Five, four, five, four. This is R, sorry, this is R prime. So it's like I have two vertices, one at R, one at R prime. And you have to figure out all the possible ways of connecting all of these lines together. Okay. So these are like two isolated versions of that, right? But then there's also the case, so you can connect it those three possible ways. Then there's also the case where you like connect this one, connect this one, and then, and then connect those two together. So there's connected and disconnected diagrams. So if we're doing it like that, there's R plus R prime. Okay, so it's three G. It's either R minus R or R prime minus R. So it's this thing squared, right? All squared, because there's two of them. <clears throat> Maybe the plus sign isn't the right thing to say there. 
There's two of them. Right? <laughs> and then you have cases that are like, you know, I've connected these two on the outside, and then I connect the R and the R prime together. Okay, so that's a little different. That'll have R minus R prime terms in it. And let's figure out that combinatorial factor next. So it's gonna be, um, so it's gonna be G squared R minus R and G squared R prime minus R. And now you gotta find the equivalent of that three. What's happening to integral? I'm gonna do it next. Okay, so. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna integrate over. All right. I mean, eventually the integral yeah. will cancel, right? Yeah. That integral will cancel. And we'll expand the denominator out. It's like a numerator denominator, we'll expand it out, it'll cancel. So we'll do the integrals next. We have to still integrate. I mean, we still have R in here, right? R and R prime. So we still have to integrate over these Green's functions. So bear with me. So that combinatorial factor, like if you screw it up, your whole perturbation theory is screwed up. So I mean, I think this is the hard part. So it's like four choose two, because you've got to choose two different. So that's somehow in there. <laughs> yeah. Four choose two. Everything's gonna be squared, because there's two, I think that's it. I think there's, so if, you know, you have to choose two of these lines to connect to its partner, right? So, and there's four possible ways to choose that, okay? And you have to do it for each of them, okay? So it's four choose two for this one, four choose two for this one. But once you choose the two partners, you could also flip, flip them, you could cross them. So it's four choose two squared times two. It's got to be, because that's what I wrote. <laughs> so, so again, you've, you've chosen two. Cho you've chosen this one and this one, this one and this one, right? So it's four choose two squared. But then you could either connect it like this, or you could connect it like this. So that's that other factor of two. So all we're doing is like a shorthand notation for the integrals. I still got to put the integrals in this. What else? Oh, you can also just connect these two over here, right? Um, these aren't, I don't know why I have equal signs. These should be plus signs. Yeah, let's put pluses here. So then I have R and R prime. One, two, three, four. And that's going to be G. It's all R prime minus R. Um, I'm gonna say four factorial because that's what I wrote. Because once you choose one, so you choose the first one, right? And there's, you know, three different ways to choose this one, and there's two different ways to choose this one, right? <clears throat> okay, so that's the unpleasant part, I guess. I don't know. Oh yeah. Every time I forget that. So that's literally just the combinatorial factors. So now we can calculate the expectation value. I'm gonna say integrals. I need my integrals here. Integral. <coughs> R R prime, two integrals. Three squared. So there's two of those. Seventy two of those. Twelve. 
24 of those. I don't know if my notations, I can't remember if the integrals are included when you draw these diagrams or not. But <clears throat> K in higher order term. So now all you have to do is calculate what these things are, basically. And you gotta worry about that integral diverging. Okay, so that's <clears throat> so this is actually remember d to the dx. So you just you have to just like take that integral. So if there's a cutoff, say it's on a finite size system, that's the way I like to think about it, of size L, you're just gonna get L to the D which will diverge as L goes to infinity. That's one. If we have two of these, I don't know, bow ties or whatever, we just have two integrals. Um, what is that? G to the fourth. So we just have this L to the D times L to the D. It's diverging even worse. And then the interesting one, the connected one, oops. Okay, we can take one integral. So we can, because we have, we can pull this G, this, essentially scalar quantity out. We need the R integral, which will give us L to the D. And then we still have the R prime integral, or vice versa. Let me keep the R integral, and that'll be squared. <clears throat> okay, so when we have some spatial dependence still, it occurs in this sort of connected diagram here. And then the last one, I can only do one integral, so it's L to the D, and the thing retains all the spatial dependence for, but I only have R left. <clears throat> Okay, so it escalated quickly. Now, we, but we have everything written in terms of integrals over you know, the two-point correlation function that in principle we should be able to calculate. That's the basic object that you need to be able to calculate this thing here. <clears throat> What's going on with all these L to the Ds? Well, let's just look at the free energy difference. F naught, which is just a Gaussian case. This will give you a bit of insight. So let me write that difference out. Let's call it delta F. <clears throat> 
It's like log Z is basically your, your free energy, T log Z. So I actually have T log of uh, E to the just minus SI evaluated, like divided by, if you will, the partition function. The thing I wrote up there. <clears throat> okay, so I've just subtracted off basically that minus log of Z naught. It's difference in free energies that matter. So just in general. So this is T minus T log of this thing that I just calculated. Plus higher order terms. <clears throat> oh yeah, here's not the denominator you're expanding, it's the logarithm. So in the spirit of perturbation theory, let me assume that I have a small parameter and use an expansion log of one plus epsilon, where epsilon is small, it's approximately equal to epsilon, epsilon squared over two, cube over three, And the reason that's justified is because, again, I'm assuming that I have a, this parameter u that's small, which is completely unjustified. This, in this case, it, it, the thing I'm going to show can be done to all orders. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's a theorem. That's a link cluster theorem. This is what I'm trying to prove. So the link cluster theorem says that this is actually what I'm doing is true to all orders. So, so unlike the perturbation theory itself, this one's much more, this is a much more justified reason to look at an expansion. Okay, so let me write it like this. So, so I have epsilon, I have epsilon squared, and my epsilon is the thing in the, in the brackets there. So let me write out the first two orders. So it's gonna be one half SI squared minus, pardon? SI expectation value squared. Okay, plus higher order terms, SI3, okay, T minus plus, hmm, okay. Inside of here, okay, this is SI squared, right? So inside of here is all these diagrams over there. So it's like this plus this plus what, oh, that one with the, plus that one. And here what I'm doing is I'm just squaring like this, this di these diagrams here for the first case. So it's minus these things here. <clears throat> So what actually happens is the contributions from the disconnected diagrams, you know, this one and this one, cancel when I write the, when I write the expansion like this. So look back and you see all the prefactors, right? You'll, you'll cancel it to this, this order. But if you go to these higher orders, they actually also all cancel. And the free energy is a nice way to see this um, because those, those diagrams that canceled would have give you, given you physical problems with your free energy.
So this is not, not a proof, but it can be proven. So actually, without doing this expansion, you can actually prove it in the, uh, with a replica trick calculation. which is calculating the ratio of partition functions that raises some power. <clears throat> you can find that in textbooks, like a complete replica trick proof of this case. But physically, which is why I wanted to look at the free energy, is these diagrams, these disconnected diagrams, basically have divergences that look like this, okay, which we pointed out. And if they didn't vanish, your, like those divergences would carry through into your free energy. So that's the physical reason that it happens. So I don't know about you, but that's kind of a physically satisfying argument for me. You need, you basically need to have your free energy scale, I guess at most, as the volume, right, of your system. So when I impose the cutoff right here on the, on the you know, length of, on the size of each one of those integrals, um, my free energy should scale as the volume. So this perturbative sort of argument or this expansion argument to, to second order, if you will, shows that, but it's actually true in all orders. So you only have to, you only have to look at, you know, this is unphysical. So when you do these types of calculations, you really only have to look at the connected diagrams. Okay, so the diagrams like this, the diagrams like this, and these disconnected ones that you can draw a line between, they don't occur in any physical quantity. <clears throat> so that was sort of just a, I don't know, that was just a life lesson. But we're going to use this and we're going to calculate the perturbative expression for the two-point correlation function. Okay, so that's the most important uh, one. So any questions on the free energy? So this is for systems that have no hyperscaling violation, right? Uh, let's see, oh, what does hyperscaling violations give you? I mean, that's space-time, that, yeah, that's space-time I mean, anisotropy. Hyperscaling is uh, usually a relation between the exponents, right? Right. The critical exponents, yeah. I guess if you have like a system with a parameter system, the free energy, you know, it's just the space of volume, but also it factors with the volume of the, of the parameter. Yeah, that's true. So that probably occurs, that probably gives you some, you know, here we've assumed that all this scaling is isotropic, okay. right? So it, it would occur basically because of the way probably your metric is dealt with in the action, yeah. yeah. So it would, it would go way, all the way back to essentially how you derive the path integral, I think. Yeah. Although I'm not 100% sure, I'm just guessing. Yeah, this is all essentially Euclidean, like the simplest space-time isotropic, you know, L to the D means that D is including space and time and everything. So it's the absolute simplest thing. Let's look at the correlation functions. It's going to be the same type of calculation. So we can also develop a perturbation theory. The same type of perturbation theory.
And what we're trying to calculate is, again, the expectation value of something. That operator will be a whole bunch of field components. And the, the proper expectation value, or the thing you actually want, I don't have a naught here because it's the full interacting theory. Remember, it's, it's this, so it's, it's the weight, you know, it's the operator, it's the integral, and we've normalized by the actual real partition function, not the Gaussian partition function. So this is the thing that we want to develop a perturbation theory for, this entire expression for that. And if I just divide this by using the same trick, the Gaussian partition function, then this expression here looks like a Gaussian expectation value, uh, right? And then a ratio of Z naught over Z. So basically by definition that's whoop where that's the Gaussian expectation value. <clears throat> okay, so it's just the same logical sort of step there. I have Z naught over Z, that's like, that's like the expectation value of That's like the Gaussian expectation value of e to, the, uh, e to the minus SI without the operator in it. Okay, so this thing out front, you can actually write as the denominator. This is Gaussian, now this is Gaussian. regardless of what that operator is. But the sort of lessons, you know, of the, of the free energy calculation uh, still apply in this case. So we'll expand the exponential and the numerator and the denominator again. And we're going to evaluate all the terms in that expansion by Wick's theorem. Okay. So I'll write that expansion. That SI depends on all your fields, but I won't write it. That's basically the, just the entire prescription for how to calculate this type of expectation value. And then the rest of this type of calculation is just plugging through the same type of procedure I just did for the free energy. So let's do a specific example. Uh, the most important one, which is the two-point correlation function. It's a long one. Is it that long? That's a lot of diagrams. I gotta go. I gotta go early. I gotta drive to the airport. So let's see if I abandon this halfway through in disgust. <laughs> okay. So this is the most important one. That's why I'm rushing it. Let's let this operator be two fields at R and R prime. Why do I call them R one and R two? I have no idea. Um, so let's write this as two terms, uh, the numerator and the denominator. And just like 
I got some form here that canceled all these disconnected diagrams. When I write this as a numerator and denominator, it'll also, there's my n, it'll also give me something that cancels um, all those disconnected diagrams. So first, I need to calculate the numerator, which is the expectation value oops, of my operator. Plus, let's see, minus u over 4 factorial. Oh, that's why. Because I have to label my field from the action, which it helps if you can go back and look at what the action is, which is the 5, 4, which has an R dependence in it. <clears throat> right? So unlike the free energy case, now I'm actually specifying um, the coordinates of my two fields that I want to calculate the expectation value for. So that's this one. I need an integral. So I got to integrate over this coordinate. And then higher order terms, I don't know, whatever, u squared terms. <laughs> Make sense? So let's um, do the first term. I got two fields, R1 and R2. There's one way to connect them. So if it's Gaussian here, you could say it's Gaussian there. Oh, that was an easy one. Now, for the second term, I have different, a different type of diagram than I've seen before. Actually, no, I think it's, it's not that different. It has some disconnected pieces, but let's see. Let's write it out. So I have R1. I have one field there. I have one field at R2. And it's like I have four fields at R. At R. Okay, put it in the middle. So it's like I have one coming here. I have four coming out here. I have one coming out there. So you got to do the same combinatorics thing. This one can connect here four ways. This one can connect here four ways. Or I can connect this one to this one, and then I have this disconnected piece. Okay, so if I do that, okay, so I have three ways to do disconnected. That'd be R1 and R2. And the three different ways come from this, just like the factor of three occurred in this diagram before. And so there's four ways to connect that. And then there, every time I connect that one, then there's three different ways to connect that one. So it's four times three ways to get diagram that looks like this. <clears throat> okay, so the numerator in that calculation is just the sum of diagrams R1, R2 plus R1, R, R2, plus R1, R2, uh, disconnected from R, plus higher order terms, U squared. Uh, 
that's a numerator. I right, still have to evaluate all those g's and everything. The denominator is just <coughs> 1 plus this plus order u squared. This is similar to the free energy. The calculation we just did. So the two-point correlation function I should put all the combinatorial prefactors in. What was this one? It was 12. There's 12 of these. There's three of these. There's three of these. Once you start writing equations like this, you know you're doing field theory. And if you start writing like just acronyms of people's last names on papers equal other acronyms, then it's like you're doing quantum gravity. So now I'm going to, instead of expanding the log like I did here, I'm just going to expand the denominator. Okay. I'll assume an epsilon again. So my two point correlation function. As a numerator, times 1 minus, say, 3 times these, oops, this is 3, this is 3, this is 12. So just like in the free energy, the cancellation of terms that are like, so it's like this term. minus, you know, three times, so it's like this term multiplied by this term, right? So it's like this term multiplied by three times this term here. There's a beauty, right? So this thing minus this times this thing. So why? It's because the disconnected diagrams in here you know, can just be written as the product of these disconnected diagrams. <clears throat> it's not a coincidence. You can look at the U, you can look at the square term. If you go to this order here and look at this term, I wrote it out. I don't think uh, you want to see it. I'll just write the denominator out. The numerator is crazy. So 
And you know what? You guys write it out, man. <laughs> Actually, just just do it. You know, I'll, I'll write it out next time. But as an exercise, just I didn't want to give this on an assignment. It's in books and everything. It's in like every single book, right? But if you look at the look at the u squared or u yeah u squared term, because you know to I guess first order in u, which is what this is, it's just too simple. You know what I mean? Sure, there's a factor of three, big deal, right? But all those combinatorial factors should cancel in, in higher dimensions. So look at the uh, u over four factorial, what, squared term. And do the numerator and the denominator again. And let's see, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms in the numerator. And when one, two, three, four, five terms in the denominator. And you keep track of all the combinatorial terms, and you keep track of all the signs, uh, then those things will cancel. Yep. I'm listening. So yeah, if, if it's higher order terms, you have to be way more careful. So like, basically, here, like, there's no disconnected part because it's, I mean, the expectation value of a single field is zero, right? But see, the connected parts come from R1 and R2. So if you have higher order, right. you know, you have R3 and R4, right? You have all these different ways of, of connecting things. So uh, you can still have disconnected pieces, right? That will not cancel. I think in that case, you can. Actually, I have. I have a uh, four-point correlation function I'll do next time, right. yeah, so we can check that. So, so in the four-point case, actually, you can have disconnected pieces, but in the correlation function, they're going to cancel. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually positive about that. In the connected correlation function. Yeah, in the, yeah, in the definition, which is the connected correlation function. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so we'll ex I'll explain this better next time, but and the connected cor endpoint correlation function by definition, all um, disconnected grid diagrams cancel. That's a theorem, link cluster theorem. The connected correlation functions are the ones you want. They're basically the ones that give you the definition, for example, of the length scale of the correlation length and so on in, in these types of problems. So yeah, look at this term, start writing out the terms. Uh, you know, you'll only do it once in your life anyway. It's fun to sort of uh, see how, how all these combinatorial factors cancel. And I'll go through the example of the two-point correlation function to order u squared. Uh, and I'll also do, I'll, we'll look briefly at the four-point diagrams just so we can see how this cancellation works in that case. So, so I'm going to let you guys go early. I'm also going to miss my flight. I booked a flight assuming awesome weather. <clears throat> You know, you know. Um, your assignment three, give it to me now. And I, your assignment four, there's some question sheets back there. It's due in two and a half weeks. And it's your second last assignment. All right, so I'll see you guys Tuesday.